All right. Welcome to day two. And uh, it is with great pleasure that I get to introduce Aroma Rodriguez. Um, she's uh, working for JP uh, Morgan Chase, and she's a tech activist. When, maybe afterwards, if you find her in the hallways, you can ask her. She did a project which she presented at uh, FOSS Asia for Shoes for the Visually Impaired. It sounds like an amazing project, and I'm keen to, to hear more about that. Uh, she's also a machine learning enthusiast, as you can probably tell from her talk, and we're very excited to hear some fake news. Take it away. Good morning. Can you all hear me? So the topic of my talk today is propaganda detection in fake news using natural language processing. The next slide talks about me. As you know, I do not seem to have anything to say over here because I think um, the session chair has covered that perfectly. So let's come back to the topic. Propa propaganda detection in fake news using natural language processing. So what is fake news? I'm sure most of you are aware here. Most of you over here are aware of what fake news is actually but I try to think of it as a prank call. Think about it as a new number that you have um, registered for, and you have a group of friends who do not know that you have a new number. And almost all of us have prank texted or prank called our friends. The prank calls generally tend to result only in mischief. Fake news, on the other hand, can result in the loss of your life savings, it can result in death for some people. It can result in prejudices being built up in the society to an extent that a faction is elected to the government and they determine policies that undermine certain communities in that particular country. Which is why fake news is a big problem in modern world and it is exacer exacerbated by the social media today. But why do you think it's called fake news? It's not called rumors, but that's what they are. Why fake news? That is because news, that is because in the modern world, news come from credible sources. At this point, we have credible news agencies which give us our news. When we're looking at news, we just consume them. We do not have any second thoughts about any of the news that we are consuming because we believe them to be credible. That is the thing with fake news. These are rumors that are presented in such a way that people think that they are credible. Fake news, like real news, has repercussions in economy and the financial situations of various countries. This is a statistic that I want you all to read. There's a reason I have highlighted the numbers in this slide. That is because I want you to consider the multiplication factor at work over here. These were only 50 stories. The multiplication factor over here is half a million. That is just the reactions that these stories got. The number of people affected because of whatever these stories contained could be, could be much larger. As a lot of us are aware of, um, the US elections were marred by fake news. So there were some reports and some investigation that went on, and this is what they found out. You'd think this would be enough for some social media organizations to be proactive about all of the fake news that is being spread through their channels. But this is the situation today. Almost 80% of these accounts are still active. This means that social media and social media organizations are not always proactive in countering uh, these problems. So the onus lies on individual action and governments. But governments have other different problems to worry about. 
which brings the onus to us as individuals. A lot of surveys have shown that a lot of people consider social media as a credible news agency. A lot of people get their news from WhatsApp and Facebook. It's not about following a credible page, a page that has been verified by that particular social media agency. It is just about normal posts by individuals on these sites. In India, and I'm from India, uh, content on WhatsApp has led to deaths. The thing about statistics is it sort of dehumanizes the problem. All you're looking at is numbers. You're not looking at the stories behind these problems. When you hear of 31 people killed, the manner in which they were killed is not very obvious in these statistics. But a lot of these cases were lynchings that went on for hours. A recent example that happened to me around three days ago, it's that recent, is the example of how, how deeply misleading fake news can be. So this is a WhatsApp forward. This is a WhatsApp forward that we got, the first text. It says that yes, bank, is going into bankruptcy. I'll tell you the con uh, context for this problem. So what has happened in India is there was a bank called PMC Bank. This is a cooperative bank, which means it is not ruled by the same regulations and rules that all the other banks are ruled by. They um, faced a bankruptcy recently, and a lot of people, because this is a cooperative bank and it is community owned, a lot of people from the community that actually ran the bank had a lot of trust in these banks, which is why they kept almost the entirety of their life savings in fixed deposits in this bank. Fixed deposits are supposed to be fixed deposits, as in the rates should not waver according to the economic uh, conditions in the market at that time. At this point, these people would be getting zero from the entire life savings. This was a forward talks about Yes Bank. Yes Bank is not a cooperative bank. But because there is a widespread panic in this society right now because of the PMC Bank incident, it is very easy to spread fake news about similar conditions and similar organizations. So what this WhatsApp forward says is, there is a huge exposure to a company that is being defaulted, because of which there could be a similar incident with the Yes Bank as there was with PMC Bank. They have also um, sent in a link which comes from Business Today. Business Today is a credible agency. So anyone reading this, reading just this and not going to the uh, article and checking out these facts would think that this is credible news. However, if you go to the article and you read it, you will not find a single sentence that corresponds to the message sent over here. Yes, Bank saw its effects, which is why they decided to file a complaint with the cyber cell. But who does that for individuals? Who does that for communities? Yes Bank is an organization because of which they could do this. So how do we identify fake news? As an individual, um, there are certain steps that we can take to identify fake news. One of them is bad grammar and spelling mistakes. Any credible news agency would be checking out their spellings. They would be checking if their grammar is in place. No news from a credible news agency would contain any of these issues. No source. Most fake news do not have a credible source behind them. A lot of praise for propaganda. So fake news, fake news has a lot of intentions behind it. Some of the intentions could be 
um, trying to get a financial event to occur in the economy. Some of these could be spam, but some of these could be propaganda. It can help get governments elected. A lot of criticism is negative propaganda. Some of the keywords in the fake news that you receive could be subjected to a Google search, and you'll realize that Google contains almost no results with all of the keywords that are there in your text, which is where you will understand that this news is fake, and also only trusting credible mainstream agencies. But all of these actions are something an individual can do. What if that individual is not informed enough to make these choices? We are informed. We have tools. We have accesses. We have the time in the world to look up all of these things, but not everyone. I think automation would lead to inclusion. Automation would lead to inclusion because when a task is automated, it doesn't consider the user who wants that task done. It doesn't consider any characteristics of that user. It doesn't consider the behavior. It doesn't consider the psychology. It knows that there is a task that needs to be done. And it goes ahead and does this task. So what if all of these steps were translated into smaller chunks and tasks? And if this problem were automated? These are also some of the other things that you could do to weed out fake news. For example, um, there has been there have been incidents of photos being photoshopped and spread across WhatsApp. So all you have to do is reverse the Google image search. And whatever images you get, you can actually find out the differences in the images. Some um, fake news websites have almost legitimate sounding names. For example, BBC News Point. There's nothing like this. It's not a legitimate agency. So how do you do this? I have managed to do this by using really basic NLP libraries that are already existing. One of them is NLTK. What you do is you find out the highest ranked keywords from a particular text. NLTK takes care of the stop words. So stop words like of the uh, all of those things are not considered keywords. To find out credible sources for keywords, it's as easy as a request call using a credible um, news API. I was using Google News. So what I do over here is I just take the URL, which is the Google uh, News API URL, I put in my highest ranked keywords over there. I put in a date. I need not put in a date. And I sort it by popularity. Whatever responses I get, I get it in this format. So if you have a proper response coming in from this news API, you get the URL and you get the source. In case that particular sentence or the particular message that you're getting is credible, you would have a legitimate URL and you would have a legitimate source. But sometimes when you're searching for keywords, there are certain other things that, that could be similar to the text that you are actually researching, which could come up in these results. So how do you find out how similar what text you have is to the credible news article. For this, also there is an API. This is also an open source NLP library. The only thing you have to do over here is you have to threshold. There's a degree of similarity that you can accept. There's a degree of similarity that you shouldn't accept. Coming to propaganda, not all fake news is propaganda. 
but some fake news, once established that it is fake news, can be processed further to determine whether it is propaganda or not. The model that I chose over here was the path model of blame. This is an existing model. Um, it has been used in psychology and literature. It is about how humans perceive blame through the way things are written, through the way things are, things are communicated. There are existing steps to the path model of blame. It starts at event detection. If you have an article or a message, you can extract certain events from that article or message, and you can cluster them as individual events. If that event is something that shows that an agency or an agent, basically an entity, has been acting so that this event has occurred, if you find an agent in that event, then there's a possibility that this is a propaganda. If it is, if the agent is something like a natural disaster, then it's not going to be, uh, going to be propaganda. If it is an organization, if it is a community, if it is an individual that turns out to be the extracted agent from this event, then there are chances that that particular text or message is propaganda. The next thing you check is the inten intentionality. This can be done by looking at the verbs used in the text. But it's not that easy. Intentionality is very obvious when uh, all of the sentences written are simple. It's not very obvious in complex and compound sentences. Once you have determined if that particular text says that a particular entity or agent intended for that particular event to occur, you look at whether they were at an obligation to prevent this event from occurring. And if they were, you determine if they were in capacity to prevent it, if they had the resources to prevent that event from happening. As you can see from uh, intentionality onwards, the agent is actually blamed, whether it's low blame or whether it's proper degree of blames. But once it's established that there was an agent involved in an event, there's always blame. Some important parameters when doing this are location, labeling, argumentation, emotions, fabrication, and the politician. I say politician because we are talking about propaganda right now. This matters because certain locations, certain places in the world are marred with fake news. You will find occurrence of not just one, but multiple occurrences of issues occurring from fake news. Labeling is when there is lab when you're labeling an individual or you're trying to label a sort of a community. That is labeling. Emotions are when that particular text is evoking any sort of emotion. If you remember the example of Yes Bank, what it was invoking is panic and fear. There was already panic and fear because of a previous incident that had occurred. So how do you extract events? There is an open source library called dbscan. What it does is it considers a group of words and it sort of um, converts them into vectors according to its relationship with all of the other words in that particular corpus. So say you have a text, you convert it into vectors. Then you cluster them. dbscan has been used to cluster before, but it can also be used to cluster NLP as a normal language by converting it into vectors. Once you have clustered um, certain parts of the text, these are going to be your events. Things that are similar to each other are going to be a part of one particular event. 
that is your event detection once you have done your event detection we come to determining whether there is an agent involved in this process or not there is a concept in nlp called entity and entity extraction what it does is it goes to a corpus of different sentences it tries to tag certain nouns as entities and it tries to find out what other patterns can be attributed and where else the same noun is repeated as say maybe a pronoun once you've used that you come up with an entity you come up with an event so now you have your entity and you have your event you check if the entity involved is an organization according to the parameters of location of fabrication of labeling you can actually determine if it's propaganda or not again these are parameters that we choose these are parameters that we put into this model to look for patterns where um, the entity is being blamed or there is an intention you look at the sentence and you try to see if it fits a particular pattern this pattern over here the pattern that i've used over here is a very simple pattern it's just a noun it's a verb and it's it's the event that has occurred the noun over here is supposed to be the agent the verb is supposed to be a particular verb that's called causative some of the active voice sentences would have these patterns it would be an individual community or an organization a causative verb and the event entity the passive voice would be event entity causative verb individual community and organization but this is only for simple sentences this doesn't work for complex and compound sentences unless you convert the compound and complex sentences into simple sentences to apply these patterns for people who are not familiar with the tags over here um these are parts of speech tags that are widely used in nlp um the meanings are explained over here there are some um parts of speech tags what about accuracy what if we try to do this on a sample piece of data so the module that i worked on was a very simple mvp it works for only simple data it works for certain patterns it works with certain thresholds that i have put in certain similarity checks and this accuracy and data cleaning exercise depends upon your use case what are you trying to solve are you just trying to give your user a sense of whether this news could be fake news or not or are you are you a government agency who is trying to see how propaganda is being spread in your society depending upon that i think the thresholds that you set the labels that you determine and the patterns that you set can be used to come up for a proper model for your particular use case the uh, texts that i went through some of them were whatsapp texts some of them were tweets some of them were articles some of them were facebook posts and some of them were smss all of these are very different from each other the way people write in all of these texts is also different so if you are trying to solve for a particular type of social media it would be easier these are some of the references that i had a look at for doing all of this the aim of um this talk is not to give you 
a basic NLP usage introduction, or it's not about how this model was created, or how this model is actually executed. It is about um, looking at a social problem and thinking, can I solve it in the technical way? Can I do what I do as a human being? Can I ask my computer to do it? Can I include people who do not probably have the literacy, the access, or the agency to verify sources of news? Will it improve their lives? And that is what I think about every time um, I do side projects. Apart from my work, I like solving projects that have a social background. And I think that if we looked at social problems as mere technical problems, maybe we could solve them. After all, wasn't fake news created because of technology and the widespread use of social media? Cannot technology solve it? That's all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aroma. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Hi, uh, this is a really good talk. Um, what I wanted to know is, why do you think that um, this kind of model hasn't been applied to any other current standing social media and you think it w ever would be to kind of uh, detect the propaganda at the source? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Uh, propaganda at source? So, so um, obviously, uh, if you can detect it earlier on, when uh, do you think it would ever be able to be applied on the source when it's... Right. So I do not know about any other countries, but in my country, and I'm from India, um, political parties have IT cells. So it doesn't come from one particular source. And this problem of WhatsApp forwards is a huge problem in my country. WhatsApp has um, started this tag, right? There's this tag that comes up if a message has been forwarded to you. So they started this because of some of the problems that came from here. As I told you, it has led to deaths. Um, finding out the source in this case would be like, it sort of depends upon the regulations of the place that you're staying at. Like, for example, again in my country, uh, you can have multiple number of um, mobile phones, you could have multiple mobile numbers. That's not something that's always verified and every, it's not verified everywhere. So pinpointing the source is probably feasible in a society where all of these things are regulated. But it's not like that everywhere. Uh, we got another question here in the back. Uh, morning, Aroma. Uh, that was a lovely side project that you have going on. Um, so I've got uh, I've got a couple of questions. So the first one is just um, in terms of determining the value to society uh, or, or to the person um, using this sort of technical tool. How do you measure that? Um, I mean, obviously, conventionally with, with machine learning, we use confusion matrices as a, as a baseline measure, but uh, how do you intend to measure it in your context? And also, um, there's a lot of work being done in the NLP space recently, especially with like the BERT model, et cetera, and those models are able to come up with text that is uh, incredibly close to, or perhaps uh, better than what uh, a journalist may actually have written up. And it's very confusing even for a real person to distinguish. And just sort of your thoughts on how you think uh, the potential like distinguishing between propaganda and not propaganda might be in, in this new era. Okay. So, um, as a measurement, basically I haven't thought of a percentage 
that I would measure it by. But it's more like it's actually personal because I've I've had a lot of friends who actually believe fake news, and even if you like sort of point them out to credible news agencies, and you're like, okay, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're thinking is the truth is not really the truth. As in, you would find those articles only on certain sites that are not really verified, and not and none of the credible news agencies has ever um, written an article on that. So they'll sort of come back to you and say, that is because the news agencies are paid to not carry that sort of an article. And the people who are running the other blogs, the blogs of the fake news, are actually doing us a favor. And they are actually being investigative journalists. That is what they believe. So with respect to that, what, um, my purpose was, is if you say you have a website, and you say you have a text that you do not know if it's true or false, or whether it's fake, or whether it's propaganda, and you come to that website, and all it does is, you have to submit it to them, and um, on the spot they'll tell you that there's a possibility that this could be fake news. Just a possibility. Just so that that individual knows that this is not something, like even though I want to consume this as news, that is not something that I want to really be doing after looking at those results. So it is more of an individual perception and uh, my personal relationships with people that I measure this, the success of a model like this by. Coming to your second question, I've forgotten parts of it. Like wasn't it like, um, Oh my God, I forgot, yeah, sorry. Let me just bring the mic so that people can hear you. Uh, the second question was just around, uh, in terms of like a lot of the new language models that are out there, especially the BERT model and its derivatives. Um, uh, with that being applied by a lot of people to uh, produce a lot of fake texts, but they, they appear very, very real uh, with the grammar and spelling, et cetera, uh, very good. Um, how do you see this role becoming more difficult in, in this new era? I think it would fail at the second step, wouldn't it? Like if there were keywords that were extracted from that particular text and they were run against a credible news API, assuming we have a credible news API, then um, the results would not show up any of the things that were written in that particular article. Also, the similarity check would, fa uh, would fail at that time because there would be no similarity detected between the text that was written by robo journalists and the real news. So um, I do not think uh, that robos which write news would be that much of a problem. With respect to propaganda, um, you can just tell people that this could be propaganda. You cannot tell them that, okay, this is the source. This is how we stop it. I do not see that as a technical problem as yet. Maybe it could be, but again, it requires a lot of physical infrastructure that's not in place, as I was telling the other person who asked the question. Um, there aren't enough regulations and rules in the whole of the world to support that. That's all. Uh, all right, I think we have time for one more question, if it's going. Aha, there's two questions. All right, all right, I'm coming. Um. Thanks so much. Um, a lot of the texts you were analyzing were WhatsApp texts. How did you get a hold of those, since it's sort of end-to-end -end encrypted and doesn't have an API? Um, well, some of them I got it personally. Oh, okay. And um, <laughs> some of them um, were in articles, as in I went through a lot of news articles, not really news articles, but these were credible blogs that were blogging about fake news. So they put up some examples of WhatsApp texts. And one of them was also um, a text that was sent to, I think it was Singapore. It was sent to the retired people there, saying that you must take out your pensions out of this certain, certain account 
otherwise you wouldn't get them after this particular period of time. Thank you. Last one? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, you know, I really appreciate the way you unpacked the sort of what fake news and all the bits that go into it. Um, the question I have is about the other side of this. So, presuming we can come up with good ways of identifying fake news, how do you present it back to people in a way that convinces them? Uh, you know, as you alluded to earlier, you have, you've experienced it with your uh, friends who, even when you point them to the right information or what you believe is the right information, they still. Uh, persist in believing it, right? Uh, you know, what, what, is the, what do the interfaces for uh, debunking these things look like? You know, how should we think about that? So there is no way I can actually influence a personal choice. And believing something is a personal choice. Sometimes, no matter whatever you show a certain people, they wouldn't believe the truth. Like, it's sort of denial. But what I feel is because this would be automated and it would not be an individual telling another individual that, you know what, this is what I have fact checked and why don't you look at all of these things? This is like, this is like for FYI, you know, for your information sort of a thing. Like, I would go to my friend and be like, okay, there's this website. Why don't you go check it out? It sort of tells you the possibility of this particular text being fake news. They would go there, they would read that. The onus is on the individual, eventually, whether they want to believe whatever the website says or not. All I want to do is remove myself out of the picture. It shouldn't be like I am telling them, no, believe what I believe in. I want them to know that there has been a credible news API that was there in the background that fact-checked whatever text they had sent to be analyzed. There were certain models that determined that this could be fake news. And it is not me as an individual who's telling you what fake news is, because it's not my perspective, but it's more like what even the technology says about that particular piece of text. Um, eventually, I do not think we can influence anyone in general. We can sort of direct them, but never fully own their choice. <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Please give a big round of applause for Aroma Rodriguez. Please do.